Hello, everybody. I am Arkady Prokop, and I'm in Mallorca. And today we have interview with Artur Rafimov, who is a known expert in Buteyko breathing technique. We would like to discuss the current situation with coronavirus infection. We would like to discuss if our methods, our techniques can be useful, if they can be helpful to prevent coronavirus infection or maybe even help uh, to recover, to at least to stay away from the most heaviest complications. So, Artur, please, would you, would you tell us uh, what Buteyko breathing technique can do for prevention of coronavirus infection or maybe even to improve the immunity during infection? Well, thank you, Arkady. Yeah, thank you for asking and for inviting for this interview. Well, I, I made quite a long video just yesterday for our YouTube channel as well, discussing a lot about actually lifestyle related to Buteyko, not as much about uh, breathing exercises. And I believe that since this infection, as I already mentioned before, um, particularly attacks people with low or poor immunity and those who already have chronic health problems, that means these people actually have quite poor health and we are most likely to be having health level less than three, less than 20 seconds for the body oxygen test, like people who have uh, all these chronic diseases and people who are old as well. And so I believe that this kind of uh, criteria, having more than 20 seconds for the body oxygen test from Buteyko viewpoint is a strong sign that it's actually people have much better immunity. And they also indicated actually this is exactly the same criteria which Dr. Buteyko taught us as practitioners when people need to, for example, get rid of cough and shortness of breath, because when we have more than 20 seconds, these symptoms disappear. And another kind of factor also relates to ability of a person to take cold shower. And Dr. Buteyko and his like colleagues in Siberia in 1960s, we discovered that 20 seconds is the same criteria when people can safely take cold shower, because with less than 20 seconds, they are very likely to develop respiratory infections of either lower or upper respiratory waves. Now, but they can that also improves the uh, balance between parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. And what mm -hmm. happens here is we know that when people are, for example, severely sick, as I was discussing yesterday, people when have ARDS already with coronavirus, they have more than 30 breaths a minute. So they breathe very fast and frequently. Mm -hmm. And our breath is actually kind of, I view it as a window through which we can see how our uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system work. Why? Because in order to take inhalation, we get this signal from the parasympathetic nerve, uh, from the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for activation of muscles. Now, when we exhale, we should just relax. And this is the state of the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. Therefore, if we look at we take a table of health zones, we can see that when people have quite heavy breathing, we do not have so-called automatic pause. And automatic pause is measured in seconds. And this is the period when people don't breathe. What does it mean? Usually we take inhale, exhale, and if people are healthy enough, we have a pause. We don't breathe at all. Like it can be two seconds, three, four seconds. And depending on the health level, it can be longer and longer. So yeah. therefore, yeah. breathing retraining kind of allows people to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So it has kind of predominance. And that, according to like, uh, some research uh, people, and I believe probably you as well, uh, we, we, uh, we would suggest that actually this state of parasympathetic uh, nervous system, when it's in kind of a leading system, allows people to activate our immune uh, potential. What would be your comments in relation to like... Yes, yes, yes. I do agree that the most important is a proper balance of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system because um, immunity requires a powerful parasympathetic sympathetic system uh, because its, uh, its immunity accumulates energy. It prepares for fighting when parasympathetic system is active. And when immunity attacks the pathogen, it's more um, related to activation of sympathetic system. But uh, people who are not healthy, especially if they have chronic disease, they uh, continuously have hypersympathetic activation. So they exhaust their resources and 
when virus attacks, they cannot mobilize um, defenses because they are just exhausted. Therefore, uh, there are very interesting uh, examples I would uh, like to show now. Uh, if we uh, take a look, just just kind of uh, just um, remind how does it look the, our cells. They are very complicated. The, the, the composition of cell is very complicated. Actually, it's a huge, huge fabric, huge plant which is constantly busy with thousands and thousands of functions. And uh, when viruses attack our cells, uh, this is the picture. Uh, a virus attacks epithelium. It can be epithelium, for instance, in nasal cavity or in oral mucosa or even intestinal, yeah? And virus inserts its DNA uh, coronavirus has RNA, yeah, ribonucleic acid, and it makes cells to produce its own copies. And millions and millions of these copies, they infect neighboring cells, and these cells are dying. So this is the huge destruction of our structure, of structure of uh, epithelium. What a natural defense against this? We have macrophages which produce interferons. And when macrophages are activated, they produce interferons. They prevent virus, virus from docking to epithelium. So it can be already a first line of defense. Then later, when uh, this line of defense is broken, still macrophages can help eliminate damaged cells so they can localize spread of virus infection. So it's very important to have enough uh, supply of interferon. Where does it, what, what uh, interferon uh, production, it's of course, it's the functions of cells. Yeah, we have special, many cells, they produce interferon. For all these um, complicated processes, they need a lot of energy. And 95% of energy comes from mitochondria. Here we see only one mitochondria. Uh, and actually in, in a cell, it's many thousands of mitochondria, which are energy power stations for cells. And mitochondria have their own DNA because they are uh, they are related to alpha proteobacteria, which inhabited our cells um, two and a half billion years ago. So they are like uh, partially uh, independent organisms and they live inside our cells. And mitochondria determine um, a lot of uh, in, in the functioning of our body because they influence energy production, they influence our immunity, and even uh, lifespan. So everything, according to this uh, scheme, it's everything uh, is depend dependent from mitochondria. Okay, let's take a look what happens when virus attacks our system. In the uh, last weeks, it, wa it, was, um, it became known that virus attacks not only mucosa, it attacks also a blood transportation system, oxygen transportation system, so hemoglobin, erythrocytes. So it, um, it damages erythrocytes, they will be destroyed, they release hemoglobin, they release iron, which induces systemic oxidative stress. And it, uh, and on the first line, it damages uh, lungs, it damages alveoli in the lungs. And of course, it's also damaging mitochondria. So the, we, we see that uh, systemic hypoxia develops, and of course, it induces a lot of uh, systemic uh, inflammation. It uh, can induce hyperimmune response. So this is uh, just a spiral spiraling to, to the catastrophe. But on the other hand, we know that this is exactly the uh, article which illustrates that uh, um, coronavirus attacks hemoglobin and damages human hem metabolism. 
Uh, how it, uh, in detail, we can see it here, uh, how coronavirus is here, SARS-CoV, yeah? how it uh, uh, talks to the mitochondria also, and it makes mitochondria to destroy and they release caspases, which induce apoptosis. So the cells, the cells just die out and release lots of virus particles. So mitochondria participate in this very important process of defense against virus. But mitochondria, are, uh, they have uh, different qualities. Um, they, we have a very efficient, very good young mitochondria, which produce a lot of ATP. And we have also a significant amount of aging mitochondria which produce much less ATP and much more free oxygen radicals. And from the balance of this, uh, what is the amount of good mitochondria or bad mitochondria, what our cells have more from this balance, a lot of uh, following uh, and develops, and depends. Because uh, mitochondria produce free, free radicals. And uh, usually people think that Free radicals are also always bad, they are always damaging. It is not the case. A certain level of free radicals is necessary. It has signaling function. It has very important functions in supporting health, supporting immunity. But when there are too much of free radicals and free oxygen radicals release is continued without interruption, then uh, uh, state of disease develops. Yeah, this is just uh, in this uh, diagram we can see a certain level is very necessary, but when it's too much, too high, then we develop pathology. Interesting thing, uh, just an article was uh, pu published uh, not long ago about mortality of Olympic athletes. So if you can see, here, uh, I can, can I show it more? Uh, just a moment. Slide show. Yeah. Yeah. So we can see uh, findings of this study that Japanese Olympic athletes lived longer compared with the general population, which was consistent with previous studies in, in their countries. Yeah, so athletes, Olympic athletes, they have very high aerobic uh, capacity. They have aerobic performance. They, especially endurance athletes like uh, marathon runners or triathlon. Um, so the higher aerobic capacity, the higher maximum of VO2, oxygen consumption, the better in general their health. On the other hand, here is the... Um, Momento. Here is the other, the bad news. The greater number of participation in the Olympic Games and higher intensity of sports disciplines were associated with higher mortality. So if a moderate stress, moderate stress, which stimulates our um, sympathetic and parasympathetic system is good for immunity, when it's too much, we see because exactly athletes who uh, participate too much in the competitions, they aging in general more fast than um, average people. Yeah. So and anyway, it's a very important information. Yeah, we see uh, how the VO2 max changing with the years, with the age. There are different categories. Yeah, runners, high intensity. These are this is the highest uh, line. They have very high VO2 max, about 70 milliliter for kilo in a minute. And the lowest untrained people, average people, they have twice lower um, aerobic capacity and it also declines. But you see uh, the speed of decline is about the same. Mm -hmm except here the yellow one runners who stopped running you see how drastically uh, drops their aerobic capacity yeah 
So it's clear from this graphic that aerobic power VO2 max had, has great advantages in preventing disease, preventing uh, damage. Uh, uh, because the same we, we can see in the all functions of our body. Yeah, so all functions, they also decline progressively with age. And the slower uh, decline of VO2 max, the slower the rate of this decline. So it can be very fast, but we can make it slower if we keep high aerobic capacity or in other words, high quality of mitochondria. Because mitochondria is the sink for oxygen. All oxygen that we inhale disappears in mitochondria. What also interesting, we know now that uh, paradoxically many young children and kids and babies, they actually, even if they are infected, they don't develop symptoms or they develop very uh, slight symptoms. So they spread virus, they can infect a lot of other people, but themselves they feel pretty much better than the older uh, folks. Why is that? Because they have other structure of hemoglobin. They have younger hemoglobin, so-called fetal hemoglobin, that binds oxygen more strongly than adult hemoglobin. And that prevents development of uh, complications. And now, interesting connection. Athletes who train in very high aerobic power, they also have certain amount of fetal hemoglobin because aerobic training induces genes which uh, increase um, hemoglobin production and part of this hemoglobin will be so-called fetal hemoglobin. So it provides uh, certain protection. Uh, the next important thing, nitrous oxide, yeah, nitric oxide, which um, is known as a mediator of uh, many functions. It uh, mediates the tonus of uh, small capillaries, arterioles. At the same time, it is a kind of antibiotic. It's universal in innate antibiotic in our body, and it prevents virus uh, docking and virus replication. So the more nitrous nitric oxide we have, the less chances a virus get uh, into in, in this bad uh, work. Yeah? It's important signaling molecules and it has inhibitory effect in some virus infection. Definitely it has um, pre preventive and curative effect in uh, syndrome, uh, respiratory syndrome, coron coronavirus. So, and uh, there's some clinical data. Nitrous oxide was used uh, in 2004 for prevention and treatment of patients suffering from severe acute respiratory syndrome. And it reversed pulmonary hypertension, improved severe hypoxia and decreased uh, duration of ventilation support. Very important, yeah? And the generous production of nitrous oxide stopped uh, coronavirus replication process. And uh, now, in uh, currently, there is a clinical study to verify this in uh, clinical patients. Very interesting, but we have our own production of NO and this can be increased, this can be improved with hypoxia. Hypoxia causes increase in nitrous oxide production through nitrous oxide synthase. Uh, the enzyme that stimulates nitro, uh, nitrate reductases to increase production of NO. And this is very important because we have nitrous oxide synthase in mitochondria, mitochondrial NO synthase, and we have endothelial NO synthase, and both can be stimulated and made uh, more powerful with hypoxic training. So what is the difference between high aerobic power yeah, and very low aerobic power? So VO2 max very high, 
let's say 100% and 100% to age, um, so uh, age uh, bind and very low the same. Uh, this is the example from a professional cycling team. I have contacts with the professional cyclists and I know one team, uh, there are uh, six uh, professional cyclists, cyclists uh, three technicians and two managers. They all infected. They got infection during uh, somewhere in, in a hotel, but from six cyclists who have very high VO2 max, not one of them developed any symptoms. Also, they show they are infected. They spread the virus. From three um, technicians, one developed uh, slight symptoms and the other little bit more symptoms. And from managers, one developed very uh, bad symptoms. He got landed to the clinic and the other has uh, some moderate symptoms. And the difference between them is VO2 max. These guys, cyclists, they have very high level, about 70 milli milliliter pro kilo pro minute. And these guys, they have maybe 35, 40. But can we improve, and as, as the correlation we already seen, the higher your aerobic capacity, the better your chances to overcome the virus infection, to fight virus infection. Yes, we can do it. So if we do nothing, yeah, the virus has chances to bring your immunity down and then you can land in a clinic with unknown result. We know that's very bad situation when artificial ventilations, a lot of uh, medications, and some people just cannot do it. But if we start training in different modes, like doing Buteyko briefing, of course, to stimulate parasympathetic system, and simultaneously different variants of hypoxic training, then we have chances to improve immunity, yeah, and get much higher, much better results. So this is our chance to prevent this decline of immunity using available options. What are these options? I, would, I, will, I will start with the simplest, which doesn't require any equipment. And it is so-called hyperventilatory hypoxic treatment. It is pretty old practice. It is known from pranayama, it is called um, so Khastrika, Rajshesha, Nishasha, Pranayama, so it's about 5,000 years old. But now it's, it became popular uh, with uh, Wim Hof, a Hollander who, uh, uh, so to say, that he suggested his own variation of this uh, treatment. So what is the physiological background of this treatment? It's very simple. You see, first of all, what do we see on this graph? This is the red one, it's the heart rate. The, uh, the green one is uh, hemoglobin saturation with oxygen percentage. How much, uh, what is the um, amount of oxygen in percentage uh, in your hemoglobin? And the yellow one, it reflects the nitrous oxide, the actual concentration of nitrous oxide. It is so-called platysmogram. So, we start hyperventilate here in this moment, yeah? Hyperventilation reduces amount of carbon dioxide and it, it's significant load for, for your heart, therefore heart frequency increases. And then after hyperventilation, for instance, after 30 deep breaths and uh, exhalations, we exhale and stop breathing and oxygen saturation drops because uh, our cells consume oxygen, but lungs, they have only very limited amount. See, oxygen saturation dropped till 90 after first hyperventilation. Then again, inhalation and oxygen saturation normalizes. Again, one more hyperventilation and you see, uh, heart frequency rises dramatically till 130. Then again, expiratory pulse, in uh, expiratory pulse, again, saturation drops lower than 90. 
and so on. And the third one, you see it drops to um, 85 and then inhalation and it's okay. So you see, we have three periods of short hypoxia, pretty deep. You cannot achieve this hypoxia just without uh, reducing your breath ventilatory volume like you do in Buteyko technique. It's impossible with Buteyko, but with this uh, technique, it's, it works. Interesting that it doesn't influence the nitrous oxide because this is the graphic, by the way, of a young man, he is uh, 35, and uh, that was his first trial with this uh, technique. Okay, let's take a look at the other one. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, important that in, in the last year, Nobel Prize was um, granted in medicine for discovery of hypoxic um, pathways, how cells sense hypoxia and how they adjust to oxygen availability. Okay, that's uh, another tema. Important that it's now deeply studied to very deep molecular biological uh, foundation. So, the other way to produce hypoxia, we use hypoxic machines, hypoxic generators. Yeah, this is one of the uh, latest model for generation device. It takes ambient air and produces oxygen reduced air, which is delivered to, for, to the mask. And then in the next five or four minutes, it, it uh, gives you oxygen enriched air. So, and the um, uh, session is controlled from, from, this, uh, uh, from this device and the parameters of the session looks like this. And these are, and this is the graphic of an experienced person who has long-term adaptation to hypoxia due to intermittent hypoxic training using this device. You see, until now, uh, this uh, test person was breathing only air. And he did uh, vent hyperventilation according to Wim Hof protocol. You see, after hyperventilation, he dropped to 80% first, yeah, and then uh, to some a little bit higher than 80, then to 80%. And heart frequency uh, increased not that much, you see, only to 55 to 60 um, bit per minute. Because when you have long term adaptation to hypoxia, your heart is much more resistant to hypoxia. Okay, then our test person started to breathe from device, uh, hypoxic air, concentration of 12%. This is the concentration of oxygen. And you see oxygen saturation drops pretty slowly. Most important, it drops without any stress. Here, with this hyperventilatory technique, um, we experience pretty serious stress, sympathetic stimulation. But when, but when we use a um, stable concentration of low oxygen air, uh, just the reverse happens. We stimulate parasympathetic response. And therefore, you see heart frequency just um, arises a little bit, then at the end of hypoxic phase till 55. And then as soon as we start breathing room air, yeah, it drops till 40. So it just shows the difference between one ventilatory technique, which induces a certain amount of stress, and the other ventilatory technique up with uh, the help of apparatus, it induces stress relaxation, just relaxation, it relieves stress. Okay, and here is the graphic of experienced person, just the typical session. This um, person has also great experience in hypoxic training. What do we see? A pretty deep uh, oscillations of saturation. Oxygen content at the beginning, it was 12% uh, and at the end, 10%. And you see heart reacts very in very relaxed mode. And most important, you see how great are the oscillations of nitrous oxide. 
Yeah, this is the capil it's a capillary plane because pulse oximeter can calculate this capillary uh, um, um, expansion and it correlates with nitrous oxide production. So, uh, so in general, uh, hypoxic training induces powerful antioxidative response, but with the help of endogenous antioxidants. It's extremely important because endogenous antioxidants and antioxidative enzymes like glutathione, superoxid dismutase, peroxidase, catalase, they are working in mitochondria where oxidative stress actually takes place. And exogenous antioxidants like vitamins and some nutritional stuff like poly phenols, flavonoids, they not necessarily come to mitochondria. They will be consumed in the cells, in the uh, cytosol, but not necessarily come to mitochondria. So it's very complicated process, but most important is that hypoxic stimulation boosts production of enzymatic endogenous antioxidants. This is the huge advantage of hypoxic training. Well, thank you for your attention and if you have questions please i'm ready to answer thank you uh, I, I have one kind of command before kind of uh, okay or maybe a couple of them yeah one relates to the fact actually hypoxic training can be done using two methods we, we did not discuss it before one yeah. of them is physical exercise mm -hmm. and according to Boteco, of course all physical exercise is done only with nose breathing for maximum health benefits, but that's one type of exercise. And what I can say, like from my experience uh, after like teaching all these years, do they a briefing method in order to improve their health? People actually re require quite high level of physical exercise, and this is I know is a big kind of a challenging part of briefing retraining and the Boteca method. Like for example, to get young people to get like to up to level even 50 or 60 seconds for the morning control course or to take a standard of health, we often need uh, up to two and a half, three hours of quite intensive exercise every day to get there. So it's very intense. That's one method. But another method is the one that Arkady teaches, and this is intermittent hyperoxic hypoxic training, which also allows hypoxic training with, uh, again, without the need of doing physical exercise. That's one kind of uh, idea that came to my mind. But uh, also another kind of uh, uh, observation, which I uh, know from physiology, like when I was writing my big book for practitioners, with Wim Hof method is actually a very powerful technique. And there is yeah. a publication that you sent to me done by one Indian doctor who investigated that uh, as well got the same result, like you can get below HT oxygen saturation for blood using this, uh, uh, ancient Rechaka Pranayama technique where yeah. you do hyperventilation, let's say 30 fast and deep breaths followed by breath fall. And then if you repeat the cycle uh, and breath fall, another important factor I discovered uh, that helps to reduce oxygen level is to do this breath fall on exhalation. So yeah. you exhale. And this Indian doctor actually, he recommends, like it's a little bit different from what, what we described, he rec recommends to do breath fall on maximum exhalation, so at residual volume, so exhale yeah, even more. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. He leaves even less oxygen in the lungs. Yeah. So instead of 2.2 liters, we have probably somewhere around yeah. no, one I, liter. This, I, this I, can, I can disagree with this because, you know, with absolutely maximal exhalation, you will have your muscles stressed. Yes, I agree. Some muscles yeah, I, will be stressed and stressed muscles, they will consume more oxygen you um, then it's not optimal and very important in this hypoxic relaxation to keep really all muscles relaxed then only two important most important organs they get the most they are most targeted with hypoxia and these are heart and brain and like the diving response exactly like like free diving mm -hmm. yeah uh, that's uh, that's yeah kind of another and one more kind of observation, which I also know because of like uh, when I was writing uh, again, like a book, my book for practitioners, uh, there are studies and I know that this is true that when people get sicker and they try to improve their breath holding time by hyperventilation, yeah. that does not work. Never. There is a certain, certain stage when we yeah. achieve 
when hyperventilation would not change the overfold in time. Yeah. And even if, when we get even sicker, that yeah. means the yeah. hyperventilation, like uh, chronic hyperventilation is stronger, the overfold in time starts to shorten if we try hyperventilation as a technique to improve the overfold. Exactly. They can even make it much worse because mostly when people live in this, uh, stay in this state, they have systemic low grade inflammation and they have already hypocapnia. They have to do low oxy, um, carbon dioxide in the blood, but it is the consequence of bad functioning mitochondria. And unless you improve mitochondria, improve their functioning, improve their quality, nothing can be helpful because uh, mitochondria, healthy mitochondria, they produce more than enough CO2. So they stabilize carbon dioxide on the cellular level. And if they work bad, they produce very little carbon dioxide, but there is a lot of lactate, which has a lot of bad consequences. Mm -hmm. And this is the typical situation with chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalomyelitis, the spectrum of such diseases. So uh, mitochondrial quality improvement is the most important basic uh, target which we, we successfully target with intermittent hypoxic hyperoxic training. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you, Arthur, for participating. And I hope we will soon meet again to discuss some more interesting aspects. And until now, thank you for being with us. Stay with us. <laughs>